What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another Sure Pro Tech Talk. Thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, we have quite the special treat for you today in honor of SM58 Day. Uh, coming up here on Saturday will be May 8th. We like to celebrate uh, uh, the SM58, you know, one of the most iconic microphones in the world. And joining us today is the Director of Acoustical, Acoustic Engineering at Sure, Mr. Ken Platt. Say hello, Ken. Hey, good morning, or good afternoon, uh, or depending, where you're good at, evening, right? depending good evening. on where you're coming from, right? All of the above. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks for having uh, me. Thank you for being here, Ken. Uh, we've got, you know, we're really excited to have you here. Um, we've got quite a few familiar faces that we see in here on a biweekly basis. Um, so I think I'm going to let you go ahead and run into uh, your, your presentation today. Ken's, Ken's going to give us all the all the answers to all the questions you have about the SM58, and hopefully uh, we all learn something, myself included. By all means, thank you. Uh, so what I've, uh, obviously I've prepared for the, uh, in honor of the SM58 and SM58 day coming up on Saturday. Not to be, you know, shadowed, but you know, happy May the 4th. May the 4th be with you, uh, just to let you know, uh, for all Star Wars fans out there. Uh, so I would really like to break, break this hour into uh, two parts. One is, uh, more of what we do in acoustics. Uh, I'm the director of acoustical engineering, and uh, I want to give you some background on what our acoustic engineers are responsible for. And I've got some slides and some pictures uh, of our lab and a lot of the locations that we have that we use to develop and test microphones, especially uh, you know in line with the SM58. So that's our primary mic that I'll be referencing and showcasing. So giving you a sneak peek a bit of um, some behind the scenes of our lab and the equipment we have. We were intending to do it as more of a walk around virtual, but with the laptop and the microphones and the headphones, I thought, well, I'm gonna try to stay stationary as much as possible. And if we can, I may get up um, and see what that means, but uh, either way, we'll try it from there. And then obviously I wanna tell you and intersperse more of uh, information about the SM58. Uh, for everyone here and answer questions accordingly. So it's okay if you have a question in the middle of this, uh, you can uh, ask or they're gonna monitor the chat, I believe, and then we can uh, make sure I can answer your questions. So again, as I mentioned, I'm uh, the Director of Acoustical Engineering. I'm celebrating my 20th anniversary coming in September of this year. So um, it's quite a, a landmark for me, but I'm still, uh, I'm still a newbie, if you will, uh, with that. Uh, it's been quite the experience. When I first started, I just want to tell you this, uh, when I got the job, um, our prior president told me, okay, Ken, you're responsible for acoustical engineering, you're responsible for our engineers, and uh, these keys uh, over to you. Uh, and be, only one thing I ask is do not change the SM58, uh, he said, that's the only thing, you cannot change it. Uh, it's tried and true and that's what we uh, will rely on. So I said, promise, uh, that's great. And so fortunately, there's a lot of responsibility, not only with making new developments and new microphones, but our responsibility is to support the existing and the legendary uh, products that we've been able to you know, produce for these many years. So uh, with that, uh, I'll start with uh, sharing my screen and giving you a bit of uh, some background here. So what do we do in acoustics? Uh, for acoustical engineering, really it breaks down into four primary uh, responsibilities. First and foremost is designing products. Um, we have, uh, what I like to reference is transducers, and that's where I'm gonna get a little bit more specific, and even the display case behind me, uh, which I'll get to later, has a variety of all the transducers that our engineers have built. I like to think of it as like the motor in a car, right? So we're we're the engine heads, we're the gear heads, we're the engineers that are coming up with the right uh, motor or uh, transducer for the application. And so we work with then our colleagues, our peers to say, okay, here's this motor, how do we make sure it fits within the car or the said microphone? Does it, you know, size wise and then even mechanically, how do we protect it, hold it, take care of it? Also electrically and all of the components there. So a lot of our engineers uh, have backgrounds in mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, uh, and then even uh, advanced degrees in acoustical engineering. So two pictures here that I'm pulling up are uh, some older renderings and cross sections of drawings of 
two primary uh, microphone transducers we make. One is uh, the dynamic microphone, like the SM58. Another is the condenser uh, microphone, where a, a transducer, where, uh, for instance, uh, KSM-9 um, or a lot of our microflex, most of all of our microflex are condenser. So um, these are the primary two uh, designs that we are responsible for, not only in um, coming up with variants and uh, improvements and changes for our next generation products, but also the responsibility of maintaining those. Um, and that's where uh, I'll break down into testing our designs. So we have to build, prototype, uh, put them together, and then we want to test them. And then we I like to break it down into two parts, objective and subjective. Uh, objective, we get actual data. Our engineers like to look at data. So we can have a number of test stations where we can make measurements uh, to get objective measurement data. We also have uh, a theater or, or a, a studio. Uh, we call it the Performance and Listening Center where we can take our products in and then we can uh, talk into them, sing into them, test them out and get some uh, subjective uh, responses of how people like, don't like, what they'd like to modify, change, and then take that feedback and make some decisions of what changes we might need to make. Okay, um, a lot of it's based on research. So we're always looking at new materials, new uh, assembly methods, new techniques, uh, we're always looking at even our competitors to say, okay, what are they coming out with and what is that is how is it compared similar to our products or what, how is it different? Um, we're active in a lot of number of uh, associations like Audio Engineering Society, Acoustical Society of America, uh, specific to acoustics, but also in this industry. Um, we try to attend as many trade shows as we can where there are a lot of workshops, uh, a lot of information gathering, trying to stay current and be in forefront uh, for our designs. And then last but not least is supporting production. Uh, we have two plants that we are responsible for making sure is our production plants, if they have questions or if they are scratching their heads saying, why isn't this uh, performing the way it's supposed to, we'll work with their uh, staff to uh, troubleshoot, analyze and understand what's happened uh, so that we can make sure the best products are going out the door. Okay, so those are the four primary uh, uh, responsibilities for acoustics. With that, um, I'd like to break down. Uh, so here's a quick story. Uh, even 20 years ago when I told my folks, I'm going to start at this company, uh, they gave me an offer to work on at Sure. And my dad, who's now well retired and he's in his later years, he said, microphones, really? Is there is there much future in microphones? Uh, and I said, oh my gosh, you don't know the half of it. Uh, there is amazing, it's again, like the motor example. Uh, yeah, that's a car motor, right? There's a lot of parts inside of a motor. Well, like a microphone, there are a lot of pieces and parts that we need to put together to make it perform the way it does. And so that's a large responsibility uh, of identifying which parts we need and how do we put them together, not only one time on the bench, but also how do we uh, make that so it's producible consistently for hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of uh, products that we'll send, send out the door. So that's uh, the example of uh, really what gets involved here with making a microphone. I have here right now the Beta 58 um, is an example of all the variety of parts, not only for the transducer, um, but also the uh, shock mount and holding parts that are near the bottom right corner here in the display. A number of these parts help us with handling uh, isolation uh, and uh, vibration isolation so that uh, with any handling noise, it decouples and it's not making its way up into the uh, transducer. So at this point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second. Hey, Ken, real quick, uh, yes. Marvin just asked, uh, what, where are the Sure Labs located? Ah, thank you. We're in uh, a suburb just north of Chicago. Uh, it's called Niles, Illinois. It's our corporate headquarters. And so our primary uh, engineering uh, for acoustics is all right here in Niles. And so we have um, this corporate facility is about 20 minutes west of where we used to be in Evanston, Illinois, where uh, Mr. Schur had moved uh, locations from the city up into Evanston uh, in the early 50s. 
And uh, then in 2003, um, Sure wanted to expand, and they found this location uh, just west of Evanston. So um, this is it was great. To, at that time, we were able to move uh, a lot of our engineering staff just a few miles away, and uh, they actually bought a lot of the updates and resources uh, when they built an extension to the building that we're in. Um, I, uh, I can tell you more about that as we go. So Niles, Illinois. Awesome, awesome. And right. uh, one more question that came in on topic here. Uh, Russ says, can you tell us how many people are in the acoustical group or is that confidential? <laughs> Uh, yes, um, so between 10 and 20 uh, engineers, uh, so uh, it's roughly in that number, so I'm not telling you exact, but um, it's uh, relatively a small group uh, compared to, uh, let's say, our mechanical engineers, all of our software engineers, our signal processing DSP engineers, um, so that's one aspect where it's really kind of a niche function, a, a niche engineering uh, that is not only responsible for, again, all of the uh, knowledge of acoustics, but also the mechanical, electrical, and working with uh, the other functions and teams. Again, it's interesting, maybe this is a good segue too, is when I started, uh, there were six engineers in the acoustics group back in Evanston. Um, and then as we've grown, not only as a company, but as we've grown uh, to support a variety of products. Right, so most of what the acoustic engineers were working on back 20 years ago were primarily microphones. And we had seen a shift from the 80s from the phonograph records and the needles, right? And so even a shift of having a lot of that knowledge base in the lab, in the mic lab and in acoustics um, and shifting to primarily microphones. Um, and even in, back in the day, uh, the acoustic engineers were responsible for our speakers and the vocal master and a lot of the pro master and a lot of the audio and the speakers. Um, and since that uh, was no longer being supported, um, really our department was relatively small because it was uh, really supporting the microphones. Now, even in the uh, 20 years ago, we started to get more into the PSM and the uh, earphones and for the monitoring. And so then we uh, were able to really learn more about uh, earphone drivers and we had to add staff and we had to add more with our headphones and our headphone designs and with the speakers. So I like to think when I say transducer, it's um, the the motor. So it's not only a microphone transducer, but it's also a speaker is a transducer in reverse, right? So um, we've added staff not only for supporting those products, but then we've even added staff as we've gotten into the conferencing and the integrated systems products and a lot more of these with arrays. So it's really expanded uh, our, our knowledge base and adding more staff that helps support all of these varieties of products. Okay, so uh, with that, I'm gonna hold up uh, as a reference the SM58, right? Um, happy SM58 day coming up. Um, I have this board that I was uh, shown 20 plus years ago. So this is more than 20 years old. Um, from our forefathers on the shoulders of giants. Uh, Ernie Seeler uh, is attributed with uh, coming up with the initial design. And here's an exploded view, view in person uh, with uh, the variety of parts. Now, what I wanted to be able to say, let's see how, oh, I'm gonna do this. If it's coming up, I'm watching on the screen. Um, a lot of the parts up on top comprise of the transducer itself. Um, and in this, we have a diaphragm and a coil, and uh, we have a magnet here and a frame, and all of these parts come together, and it's like a mini speaker, but as we're doing it in reverse, the uh, diaphragm uh, will move with sound. The acoustic energy, uh, the sound, will move the diaphragm and within the coil, and it'll make electricity, or it'll uh, give a, a signal at the end. Um, what I've been told uh, by our corporate historian, Michael Pedersen, shout out to him. Uh, interesting fun facts is that even in its highest excursion, as the diaphragm moves up and down, it'll only move about in a, a millionth of an inch in, in distance. It only moves, so you can't even see it with your bare eye uh, as it's moving, as opposed to like a 15 inch subwoofer, right? Uh, that can move upwards of an inch or so, or even more. Um, so just in terms of scale, what's happening here. 
the coil itself uh, is a, a single wire that's wrapped around many times and it gets up to about 40 feet of wire length uh, to make up the coil. Um, and so all of the, not only design that I'm showing you here, but all of the, the stations that we have in our manufacturing plant to assemble and make all these parts and then put them together uh, repeatedly. Then there's what we call acoustic resistance. There are three resistance parts in our design um, and that helps control the sound from when it comes in the front of the microphone uh, to the back as it comes around and gets to the back. And as there's a delay, we call it a delay circuit, it takes longer for it to get to the back and that's how we can tune the microphone to be, in this case, a cardioid microphone. Um, and that we can reduce the pickup from the backside and uh, enable more of the primary pickup on the front. Okay, so deciding on the materials for these resistance parts and then how to make sure that uh, they all work together in unison to give us that same response microphone after microphone, uh, one after the other, um, for over 450 years, right? So what's the anniversary? Are we coming up on, I've, I'm forgetting, uh, maybe someone can tell me. It's, I think, 65, 66 is when um, the SM58 came out. I should know that, right? Uh, hey, there you go. Uh, so this is an example of uh, all the parts and pieces that go into it. Now, any questions before I go to more of our next part of the mic lab and the tour. Yeah, by the way, um, fantastic surprise today. Mr. Michael Pedersen, who you mentioned a minute ago, has actually on this webinar, so he may pop in for a guest appearance at some point. <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh, that's great. And I know he's so knowledgeable and he has so much information. Uh, that's great. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna share this now with the uh, screen, right? So. Uh, where I'm sitting right now uh, is in the aisle way. So we're in what we call the annex. The annex was an addition to our main atrium building when we moved, uh, when Sher decided to move to this location uh, back in 2003. They realized we have a lot of test equipment and test gear that uh, we need to move. And so they said, we're gonna have to add on because um, the current office building that they had purchased uh, didn't have really the space. So they, built this large annex that not only holds a majority of our acoustic response, our acoustic engineers' desks and benches and workbenches, but it has all of our quality lab uh, services and equipment here. Um, a lot of test chambers, a lot of environmental chambers, and they do a lot of the quality testing here. Um, so I'm gonna sprinkle in a bit more of that quality aspect uh, in addition to the mic lab and the core. Mike Lab is responsible for uh, designing and building and testing uh, designs, right? So I'm in the aisle and you see on the left, it says Mike Lab. That's one thing Mrs. Schur, when she was with us, uh, asked for is to uh, put big letters, paint them letters on uh, the walls. As you go down the aisle, you can see Mike Lab, you can see Anacoic Chamber, you can see the quality area. Um, and so nice uh, uh, designation. When the man was painting it, uh, the mic lab, I was here and he said to his uh, other associate, he said, Mick lab, what is that? What's Mick lab? And I had to stop and say, ah, we, it's our reference as mic lab uh, for that. So we have what I like to say a lot of old gear and a lot of new gear. A lot of the tried and true test equipment still works to this day and we've brought it over and it's been working uh, and it helps us. But then. We've also got a lot of updated computers and software that we use, and I'll, I'll cover that here. And so with the uh, primary is the workbenches that we have, and then we also have the anechoic chamber, uh, which is shown here in the third uh, picture on the right, uh, which is really our reference chamber, where we test all of our microphones in that chamber. And uh, right next door, we were able to build two at the same time. Uh, so we work with one in engineering, and then quality uses the second chamber uh, for their audits and their measurements and testing. And then we don't have to uh, step on each other's toes for scheduling. Um, we have multiple locations in the annex where we have our acoustic engineers on the primary floor, uh, the second floor, uh, we have a lot with, um, even in the fifth floor up in the atrium, we have sections where we're doing microphone development, we do earphone development, we do headphone development, and we've been pretty flexible where these cubes and these stations have been 
uh, they can be reconfigured depending on the teams. So a lot of team areas where we bring all functions together and say, okay, you're on this team and then you're going to you know, see this into production. Um, and so that's where, as you might anticipate, even with us being a lot of parts and pieces, it gets crowded and we get a lot of you know, material and parts and pieces and then I'm always on uh, the staff, okay, we got to clean up, you know, this stuff is from the prior project, let's clean up and bring in the new stuff. Um, a large part of the Mic Lab and the acoustics group is to be self-sufficient where we can prototype and build things like it's being done in the plant, in production, so that we're always having an eye on, you know, as we develop our, our designs, that they can be easily transitioned into our plants. And it's not like we have to say, okay, we have to start over. Once we can show that something works on the bench, how does it uh, make its way into production and it can be reproduced? Um, so for example, on the left, uh, making diaphragms, uh, dynamic diaphragms, like in the SM58, we have a hot and cold press where we can have the different formers and we can lay a thin sheet of um, uh, mylar on top of the form and then you press it down and it makes that impression and it can give us the ridges and the rolls, all the designs of a diaphragm um, out of that press. And then we go to the cold press and it can cool it off and then we can test it. We have this in the middle as a, a laser trimming station where instead of taking scissors or a razor to trim the edges, um, we have now uh, programmed a laser to help us with these. And this is all for prototyping, um, but they mimic our plant uh, both plants uh, to help with, you know, being consistent. The condenser diaphragm station is uh, for the other design uh, as opposed to a dynamic, the condenser where we can actually form diaphragms and we can then trim them for a variety of sizes and shapes and sizes and such like that. We have a magnetizer, a large magnetizer we bought just a few years ago that can magnetize both alnico and neodymium. Neodymium is more and more common um, and less expensive than uh, it used to be back in the day. And so we have a variety of ways for our microphones that we can test um, all the different types of magnets and shapes and sizes. We can even coil, uh, wind coils uh, with the center picture where we can make coils not only for um, microphones, but also for headphones and earphones um, as they're used in the micro speakers. Another one is laminar flow hoods. We have those where they are constantly drawing air out of the uh, hood so that dust doesn't settle on our parts. And that way we can um, do the assembly and, and stack the parts in uh, a housing or a design. And then we can uh, take them right into the anechoic chamber and test them. So these hoods are positioned right outside the door of our anechoic chamber where we can do some micro assembly um, and then bring it into the chamber, test it, take it back out, change a part, put it back in the chamber and test it. So that's uh, our process of being able to go back and forth. Um, we have a number of test stations, right? So this is uh, an example on the top left is an earphone test station where we have these uh, couplers where you can insert the nozzle of your earphone into the coupler uh, and then you can run a script, uh, a test program where it can do a frequency sweep where you can see the low frequency all the way to the high frequency. Um, and we can see if it's consistent or it's what we want, right? And then likewise for the middle picture for the headphone test station, we have a number of fixtures where we can put either individual drivers on a fixture or we can put the full headphone on uh, the fixture and have both cups uh, being run and we can see measurements both left and right. Um, and then the third picture is for our anechoic chamber. And that's the primary reference. As I mentioned, uh, our plants each have smaller anechoic chambers and they're using that for audit purposes and they're testing product as they assemble it. Um, if there's any questions, we'll have them send it back to this one because all of our uh, ones here in Niles, uh, our products can be referenced uh, by being tested in the anechoic chamber here in Niles, okay? Clipple is uh, becoming more and more popular in acoustic uh, transducer development, where initially they were doing it more for speakers, and then we've been able to find we can test it for microphones also. And what it is is a laser that points down uh, onto a diaphragm, and we can move the diaphragm uh, three axes. We can move it left, right, and up and down, or the laser head can be moved 
um, and then we can see the excursion. We, we see how high up and down the diaphragm moves. And with that, you can actually, it does a mapping where it can actually measure the excursion, how high it goes up and down across the full diaphragm. And then we can see if the diaphragm is always the same shape or if it bends and it cracks or seam lines in it and it can lead to distortion. So there's a way for us to visually um, measure now our transducers with the laser and we can then uh, make decisions on uh, what parts might need to be modified or changed to give us the best sensitivity with minimal distortion. I'm also, uh, we have on our bench uh, measuring resonance. A large part of measuring diaphragm resonance is both in a vacuum and in air. And that's where we can do the math, if you will, to understand um, how uh, a material or a design will resonate. Uh, and we can measure that and see where the resonance is. Ideally, you want to understand that in the overall microphone response or the speaker response is understanding how it performs relative to the diaphragm resonance or the overall transducer resonance. And so uh, having equipment like that uh, gives us that insight. The one on the right is about vibration testing. Um, the uh, main cylinder here that's shown in the front of the screen uh, is where we can put fixtures on top and we can put like the SM58 on top and it shakes it. It's like a, I was just in Home Depot uh, this weekend getting some paint stain and uh, they put it into the uh, shaker, if you will. Those are a bit more extreme than what this is when they were shaking the paint uh, to, uh, uh, help make sure it's thoroughly mixed. Uh, this, we can actually make measurements with accelerometers on the microphone, and we can see when we shake it at low frequencies to mimic handling noise, we can understand uh, how well our microphone is uh, not picking up that uh, vibration. Because our whole intent, even with the SM58, is we have the shock mount rubber parts inside of there, and that's a large part of our secret sauce of understanding how that design is made. The type of rubber, uh, the size, the shape, a lot of um, engineering that when it's developed over 50 years ago is still really a differentiator for our microphone, the SM58, compared to all of our competitors. Um, and there's, a, you know, that's, we're the ones to beat with that still to this day. Manometer. Manometer is a great device. It looks antiquated, and that's uh, because it is. But we have a number of other updated digital manometers in um, the plants when we're uh, measuring. It's uh, to measure acoustic resistance. So if uh, I may say we have different meshes, cloth mesh, wire mesh, uh, and uh, slotted parts that we uh, use to control airflow. So is if you can choose the weave, you can uh, limit how much air will flow through a cloth or a mesh. And that's part of um, how we do the tuning of our um, microphones, where we can control the delay of sound getting it to the back of the diaphragm. And so with that, this is our baseline test station where we can take a variety of cloths and materials and we can measure airflow through that and make decisions on um, if it's right for the design. Okay. Another one uh, is a great thing is pop testing. Um, that's the plosives or pop that a microphone may pick up on, and we try to minimize that and diminish it. This is uh, uh, where we actually have a speaker coupled to a funnel, and there's little puffs of air. We can do it like five hertz, and it actually you can put uh, a microphone with its grill or even uh, a windscreen on top, and we can see how well that protects it from plosives and pop. And so actual physical measurements we can make, and then we can make decisions from there. Um, there's a lot more too. There's a lot of stations where we do assembly in the lab. We have a variety of charging stations where we can charge our uh, backplates that are used in condenser microphones. We do noise testing, uh, whether it's um, in a humid environment or if it's a dry environment. We want to make sure that our electronics and even our cartridges um, don't have a lot of self-noise based on in the humidity or the environment. Uh, and especially if you know performers on stage, uh, even if it's raining uh, or if it's a light mist and hu high humidity, a lot of the electronics uh, uh, need to be isolated and protected. So we have a lot of test equipment and uh, processes involved to make sure that our microphones can take it 
take everything that's thrown at them. Um, the one in the middle is a, a head and torso simulator. We call it HATS from B&K. They're uh, a premium company that does a lot of the instrumentation uh, measurement equipment. And so with that, we can even, uh, it's got microphones in the ears and it's got a small speaker in the mouth. And so we can do a variety of tests of testing our headphones. We can test our earphones with that. We can even put uh, the microphones uh, in front of the mouth uh, on a headset uh, and we can make measurements with that. So as a, a baseline typical uh, mannequin, we can uh, get information from that. Um, and what was behind me is a display case. And then as I stop sharing my screen, I can show you we've got a variety of uh, the various transducers that we have designed uh, over the years and that are an example of reuse. So not only like the SM58, but saying, okay, this transducer is very similar to the same transducer in the SM57, if not very much the same transducer in the SM57. And then what I like to say to our new engineers, and even as uh, they're working in the lab, is that when we're asked to develop a new microphone, before you start from scratch, go look and see if any of the existing transducers will meet the requirements. And if we should start with uh, something known and then tweak it or adjust it or modify it depending on the requirements. So there's a, in the drawers that are shown in that screen below, we have a variety of uh, transducers that are in the display case that they can take out, look at, um, and measure and use and from there. So I think that's the last of my slides there. So I'm gonna stop sharing and come back to the screen here. Um, and as I said, I'm standing in front of, I'm sitting in front of the display case here um, for that. So there's a quick, <laughs> if you will, uh, run through. It's almost like you were here, right? Uh, and seeing all the stuff. How about uh, any questions? Ken, that was awesome. Whole, what a what a wealth of knowledge you are. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, uh, attendees, groups, if you've got any questions about the 58 in general or Ken's position or acoustics or what we do at Sure for testing and design, please fire those in the chat. Uh, Richard does ask, um, in the pictures that you, sh you did show, um, can you expand on the software utilized for testing? Ah, thank you. Um, in fact, uh, I do have some other slides here, so let me do that. The one is uh, I want to show here is Soundcheck. In the top right here is uh, the primary tool. It's uh, the program is from Listen Inc. Uh, Listen Inc. is a number of the the owners uh, came from B and K. So B and K, Barul and Care. Um, started their own company called Listen Inc. It's now become a standard tool for testing uh, microphones and speakers. And so we'll use this in as a primary software tool to use in our anechoic chamber. When we'll run a stimulus, we'll run a speaker uh, to run a signal to then receive signal in the given microphone. And then we can plot out an on-axis response and then off-axis response. And then we can do a lot of uh, data analysis and multiple curves and look at trends and things like that. Um, there's another uh, program or also called Audio Precision. That's another large uh, offering with a number of tools that they offer. So we're looking at using both uh, now in the company, not only for development, but also uh, there's a larger push now to start using more audio precision in our plants uh, to make uh, quick sweep measurements to make sure that our our products are performing as expected. Within terms of development, um, one of the standard uh, tools in engineering is MATLAB, and it's very diverse uh, with using um, the number of tools in that suite of MATLAB. MathWorks uh, owns MATLAB. Uh, it's a powerful uh, number cruncher, if you will. So we can bring a lot of the data that we gather from uh, uh, SoundCheck that I just referenced, and we can use MATLAB to help uh, look at the data and the response curves. Um, and one part, as I just showed, was SoundCheck, where you can get the response curves uh, on axis and off axis. You can also get uh, distortion uh, information. You can get noise information. And so a lot of the values or parameters we can bring in and then look at uh, averages and max and min and trends. Um, a tool that's now, uh, it was originally called Maxwell. They got bought by Ansoft and Ansys is a, a large finite element analysis uh, program. Uh, we use this 
part of the suite of tools called Maxwell that helps us model magnets. Uh, so we can actually you know, put in a, a size and shape of a given magnet, uh, and we can see how that energy is, um, it travels through the metal parts, the magnetic parts, um, and it works through a frame. So we can see how that works with the corresponding parts that it's sitting in, um, and with a voice coil, we can see the energy um, all on the computer. So even before we build, we can anticipate uh, how much the voice coil is gonna move inside the gap, and we can learn how high of uh, an excursion for either a speaker, or how much we're gonna get out of a microphone by having this and it's really becoming each you know year as they say with the software it's amazing the the capabilities of predicting performance even before we build it speaking of which uh, a large uh, amount of um, our software that we are using in acoustics is based it's on called Comsol. Comsol has been around for maybe I'd say 10 plus years and they keep improving it um, more and more where we can actually build the whole transducer, if you will, into uh, the model, uh, whether it's condenser, it's dynamic, uh, it's a ribbon mic, um, even MEMS microphones. A lot of these now we can uh, build in the tool and then you can give it a stimulus, uh, a sound and energy, um, and then you can see the corresponding anticipated results. So we're trying to encourage more of that, uh, obviously to keep you know efficient and to be uh, able to understand how to set it up and uh, get the results and then translate that into, okay, how, what do we wanna build, right? So it's becoming somewhat un very universal um, as a tool in the uh, speaker, microphone, uh, acoustics, uh, development uh, for many companies. And LabVIEW has uh, been around for a while. It's to more control. It's uh, a program that you can use to control test equipment. So you can run a number of scripts and you can try to say, okay, if I want to automate some tests, how do I want to uh, set that up? So that's something that as we have different test equipment and we want to in you know, work with each piece rather than turning the knobs by hand, you can run actual scripts to uh, run these tests. SPICE, LT SPICE is an electrical engineering uh, simulation tool that you can draw up circuits uh, in the computer and see what the corresponding result would be. Um, and then likewise, the mechanical CAD tool is NX, um, NX Siemens. They uh, keep updating, you know, the mechanical parts and pieces and as you can, uh, visualize uh, a design in the computer, then you can anticipate, okay, and what's nice is you can take a lot of these designs in Siemens NX and you can bring them and import them into Comsol or you can import them into Maxwell and vice versa. So they're pretty universal with being able to use other tools and bring them in back and forth um, to model that. So those for some of our tools in acoustics, but it's also the overlap because acoustics is mechanical, it is electrical, that our engineers need to have familiarity and uh, knowledge with how to use them uh, so that we can be uh, most efficient. How's that sound? Thanks, Ken. Yeah, we had a question come up, uh, kind of like a, like a fun question was, is there a certain test that you think is the most fun that you like to do? I mean, yeah, so fun. Well, you know, uh, one of the things that come immediately to mind is with the quality uh, testing uh, that we have. So we have a quality division, and for the microphones, and especially the SM58, I like to say fun, but it's also an infamous uh, test is the drop test, the six foot drop test. Um, and that's where sometimes we have a healthy friction between engineering, uh, development engineering, and quality engineering because quality always wants to break our stuff. They always want to you know, be so extreme. They're so hard on our stuff. Well, rightfully so. Rugged, reliable, uh, and that's our brand. We need to know that when you drop it, I'm trying to keep it in the picture here. Um, not only at the six foot uh, is an immediate drop onto a hardwood surface or a concrete surface, and then doing it multiple times. Even on a microphone stand, we'll actually drop it when it's attached to a stand. Um, the drop tests are always the most fun because uh, you see stuff and it shatters or it breaks or it flies off and you kind of stand back. Um, and then what's really fun is when you plug it back in and it still works. 
Um, you know, there's been some number of YouTube videos even for our seventh floor in our atrium. They've taken an SM58 and dropped it from the seventh floor. Um, it's been uh, great to see plug it in and it still works. Well, thanks for sharing. Yeah, it's always awesome uh, going by the uh, the product validation lab and seeing them break stuff. Uh, it's, yeah, uh, right. It never gets old. It never, it never does. Uh, and uh, we still we still test the 58 um, all the time. So it's it's you know we can't can't rest with what we got. Exactly. Um, Tried and true. There's a couple other questions. Michael Pedersen actually was asking about um, is the air trapped inside the 58 important to its performance? Very much. Uh, yes. So I like to think of it as, um, again, the acoustic engineers, we're responsible. I like analogies here of we're the heating and cooling guys also. In addition to being motorheads, we're the, uh, the heating and cooling guys. We're ducting air work. You know, we're doing the, heat, the duct work to make sure we understand where the air is flowing. And so we want to make sure that, it, you know, the primary air gets to the front of the diaphragm on all of our microphones. And then we're putting some protection, whether it's the grill itself um, or the foam that's inside um, and controlling, making sure it doesn't pop, it doesn't, uh, the plosives, um, all the things, you know, inside and protection from the weather and details. Now, um, we want the primary to get in the front and then when it gets around to the back, we want it to still make its way in to get to the back of the diaphragm, but we wanna you know, control that. So we have a number of tricks up our sleeves, um, if you will, of ways to control and limit how fast uh, and how much gets to that. Um, and so uh, controlling that air and then letting it event, you know, get out, right? So as it's going in, you know, it's a matter of, uh, like I think like pistons in an engine, right? And pistons in the valves, you want as much air to come into the motor as you want air to escape out so that you can do a refire, right? So there is some aspects of choosing the right materials and the design to make sure it can uh, respond accordingly. That's excellent. Um, thanks for that. Um, yes. Bill was asking, uh, he was like, did you say that the 57 and 58 are basically the same mic? So the transducer is the same transducer in the SM57, SM58. It, uh, but with the grill on the exterior, um, they're obviously differentiated by that. Um, and where initially this was posed as a vocal mic on a stand for vocal, um, and then the 57 was mostly used for instruments uh, and set up, and that the, uh, the head uh, could take uh, the drumstick hits, uh, if you will, right, and uh, doing that. But the the core transducer is the same, um, only differentiated by the the grill and the screen. Uh, that. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. Um, uh, I think Bill was asking uh, what. It's kind of off topic a little, but he's like, "What model headphones are you using?" Oh, these are our um, 1540. Uh, this is uh, the with the carbon fiber uh, on the side. So this is uh, the wired. So we have a, a full line. Don't forget about our wired headphones, uh, you know, the audiophile level uh, headphones. Um, and so I've enjoyed, this is actually an earlier prototype that I've been able to keep uh, within my reach uh, to use. That's sweet. Um, somebody was asking, do you have a favorite 58 story, SM58 story? That's a good question. Um, I, I, I'll be f a full disclosure here. Um, I am one of the few people here at Sure that I'm not an actual musician. Uh, so, so many people are musicians uh, and I, um, my background has been more of transducers and developing transducers and uh, more for underwater. I initially started with underwater transducers for hydrophones. Uh, and so then made my way into crawled up on air onto ground, you know, from underwater to on the crawled up on land and got into speakers and speakers for automotive and making speakers and systems and such. I've always had big speakers in my dorm room. And then even as I've, you know, gone from home to home, I've graduated up to larger speakers and big sound systems. So I love listening to a variety of music and home theater systems and speaker systems and Stereo. With the SM58, back to this, um, tried and true. My story reference of this is the, 
the responsibility I have, and it's a great example of not only our, some of our history and where we've come from, but it's also a great example of what's still relevant today um, and a lot of the engineering and design. So unfortunately, I don't have a specific example um, and when I've either been playing or singing into it. Um, although I can say uh, one is when my daughter was very young and I hooked up an SM58 to a small little portable speaker at home and doing some karaoke. She really enjoyed it. So um, that was music to my ears, if you will. To dump bump. Uh, so that's my reference, uh, SM58, and they at a, you know, three, four years old when they could just barely start to talk and speak. Um, I love that. Uh, that's it. And sure sightings, right? So they've grown up with uh, sure sightings as I keep pointing to the TV and anywhere we can see it uh, in the sure mics. Oh, my wife loves that, definitely. That's a sure mic, sure mic. <laughs> right. <laughs> So yeah, oh, very much so. Really awesome. I, you know, I heard a quote uh, not too long ago. Somebody was like, "Well, there are a lot of different choices of microphones, and some perform better than others, but the 58 is never the wrong choice." So, uh, yeah, I thought that was pretty, uh, pretty enlightening. That's right. Um, speaking of 5857, uh, Don was asking about the 57 head spin. Uh, is it supposed to spin around on the on the 57? Yes. It is supposed to spin. Uh, it is meant to uh, rotate around uh, to be uh, able to be clipped in place, but then there was concerns of the rattle. Um, it, it, sometimes we would have uh, it rattle. So there's been some tightening up of the dimensions of the plastic to make sure that um, it clips, that it, it doesn't have rattle. So there's been work uh, over the years to try to make sure, because with any part, you know, you know, any of these designs, you know, is because it's been in business for so long, vendors uh, for the most part have stayed the same, but we've had some vendors come and go. And so we've been in, that's the engineering we do behind the scenes is to mimic and match the same parts. And sometimes the tools wear, the dies wear. Um, and so the, the constant maintenance that we have is to make sure that when initially the SM57, the grill, was starting to rattle, um, we went back and looked at um, making sure that the tools and the molds were correct to hold that in place. So in doing that, it's okay though too, if uh, that's what my understanding is. I, I'm not sure Michael Pedersen might be chiming in right now saying, well, Ken, you know, I have a different opinion, but- uh, Well, Ken, I, I have a different I, opinion. <laughs> well, thank you. There no, he is. Thank no, you. No, 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 no. Please you're correct right. me if I'm wrong, Michael. No, you're right. It, it, it spins. It's not, you know, it, it goes back to how the grill was held on originally. That was all. Uh, we had a we had a design patent for that microphone, actually for the 545, um, and it was just how they decided to hold it on there. Um, the, the the worst thing people can do is think that, it, first of all, some people think you turn it and it changes the polar pattern. That's not correct. Um, That's right. Some people take and they take tape and they tape it around it to stop it from turning and then you turn it into a very bad omni. So just, it's supposed to spin and just enjoy it. <laughs> that's that's right. good advice, Michael. I, I've, I've definitely seen electrical tape and gaff tape around 57 heads for that for that reason. But uh, ben, I, a, I, I, there is a company, tape. I saw a company that makes a clamp that goes around the SM57 and they call it the SM57 Omni Clamp. And I said, oh, no, 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 don't no, do no, that. No. <laughs> Ouch, ouch. Well, that's another good point. Thank you, Michael. And uh, I'll, I'll try to best advocate uh, for that. You know, you'll see a number of artists and how they hold their microphone. Um, it's best for the overall best performance is to keep your hand on the handle. Um, if you start to encroach up halfway, um, you're going to start to minimize how the sound can get in the back and how it can be as effective as a, a cardioid pattern. Um, and you'll start to get up to be a, an omni if you're not careful. So best practices are, if they can, to uh, keep their hand on the handle. It's great advice. We, we talk about that quite often, Ken. A lot of our participants here, as well as our artist relations department, are, are constantly talking talking about that. So um, I had a question here. I'm not sure if we can talk about it, but uh, somebody's asking, uh, can you like talk about production, um, how many are assembled daily? Uh, I don't know if you can share that. Um, thank you. Uh, I don't. I don't know if I can share that, uh, so that's I'm gonna err on the side of caution there. Um, but we're in the thousands per day, uh, so it's uh, upwards over a couple thousand a day. Uh, so more than that, uh, less vice versa. So I won't give you a specific number, but uh, it's in the thousands. Yeah. Can I add in a couple of things? Yes. 
Please. First year of sales, 145 units. And we and we reached our millionth around 1995 or 1996. And we won't say any more than that. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. That's awesome. And again, I'm I'm proud to say that I'm still here. Uh, we're still keeping the keys on it. Uh, we haven't changed it, and it's tried and true. So, uh, as I started out this presentation with uh, that direction from our prior president, um, it is it's really and not to sound corny, but it is an honor to be able to work on these designs and uh, with our staff, having that understanding of we're in new development. We're always trying to make new, better, more uh, direct for our customers what they need but also the responsibility of uh, maintaining these tried and true products um, is really what gives us that well-rounded um, understanding and appreciation for this. So I wanted to explain that too. Thanks, Ken. Um, we had a question, uh, Asia was asking about um, weatherproof or underwater microphones. Does Sure have any underwater products uh, currently? No, uh, we do not have uh, any microphones that are meant to work underwater or perform underwater. Um, we do have, we just recently released a, a lavalier microphone uh, called Duraplex that is IPX rated, IPX 5.7. And the 5.7 uh, refers to dust ingress and dirt. And then the 7 refers to being underwater uh, for one meter of water for 30 minutes. Uh, and then as you can take it out, uh, it should, you know, it should work. It will, it will continue to work. It's been certified and rated. So to be clear, right, um, when I my referenced my earlier work with working with hydrophones, those were meant to work underwater, uh, whereas uh, what Sure makes right now is meant to be used above water. <laughs> That's excellent. Uh, thanks for that. Um, mm -hmm. This question comes up quite a bit. I'm sure you, you've probably been asked it a lot, um, but Bill is asking, what's the difference between the 58 and the beta 58? Ah, so the uh, SM58 is an Alnico magnet. The beta 58 is neodymium, so two different magnets. Um, the uh, other noticeable design aspect is that the SM58's grill is meant to dent in upon drop. Uh, to protect. It's more of like a shock absorber. When it does hit, you'll notice that, you know, um, they will easily dent or easily, relatively easy, right? <laughs> um, it's like a badge of honor, right? If you're using a microphone that has dents, uh, that means you're, you're a well-traveled uh, musician. Right? Let's call it that. But um, the Beta 58 is what we call a hardened grill. It's a hard grill. The transducer inside is lighter than the SM58. So the SM58's mass is heavier, so it needs a, a softer grill to take more of the impact, whereas the Beta 58's grill is hard. It allows for just as much impact and hit without damaging the microphone. And that, that's more of two distinct things, material-wise and uh, grill-wise. The response curves are there, and it's more subjective of people's preference um, for performance. Exact colors or palettes of an uh, artist uh paintbrush exactly um that's that's a great explanation uh, it comes up quite a bit got a couple comments uh somebody i uh, was asking will we make the silver anniversary edition available again i guess they uh, they like that version quite a bit um and another comment was uh was talking about the 57 and how uh they love to use it on the snare snare drum with two of them and flipping the phase on one and varying the uh, uh the response between you know snap and snare content and that kind of thing which is a pretty pretty common trick for for making up a snare and how excellent that does work so uh thanks for sharing that don i uh, appreciate that lauren was asking about studies about the effects of uv light cleaning and i know that's a big topic um we've been very active i know uh about keeping up to date with that and um, maybe one of my colleagues can put a, a link to the resources that we have available online for uh, cleaning your microphone, maintaining it, and all that stuff. Uh, what to use, what not to use. We have a whole whole web page of that, which we do keep updated quite often. So um, check that link uh, in the chat and uh, for for more information about you know keeping your mic sanitary and uh, you know effects of UV sanitation, you know, sanitization versus chemicals and all that kind of stuff. Jamel was asking about. Uh, has anybody tried to drop the Beta 58 from the seventh floor like we've done with the 58? Have there been extreme Beta 58 tests? 
Um, not to my knowledge, actually. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the the primary one, the one that we're aware of that's on still, I think it's still on YouTube, uh, is the SM58. But um, no, the Beta 58 and all of our microphones go through the standard quality tests of the six foot drop multiple times, uh, uh, direct drop and stand drop. Uh, so that's as far as I understand we've taken it. That's excellent. And maybe it's a, a topic for a future tech talk, and uh, maybe so. There it is. All right, uh, we're in right. the near the session here. Uh, the questions are kind of slowing down, and uh, well, this is really awesome, Ken. I, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to educate us and share all the cool stuff you're working on and the history. And uh, thanks to Michael Pedersen for for chiming in and and dropping yep. some knowledge on us as well. Uh, it's, it's so awesome. I know our viewers uh, really appreciate it. A lot of thank yous in the chat and uh, some of the regulars that are that join us every Tuesday or every other Tuesday are, are very happy about it. So uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Happy to talk. Yes. Take care. Cool. Thank you, Ken. Um, hey, before everybody jumps, I just wanted to run over uh, a couple things we're doing on 58 Day on Saturday. Um, uh, we do have a couple uh, events scheduled in certain places across the country, so hopefully you're close to one of them. If not, uh, maybe we'll try to do some more stuff uh, next year. But if you're in Nashville like I am uh, on Saturday, May 8th, 58 day, and the Soundcheck parking lot um, from like 11 to 2 p.m., we're going to be grilling up some some burgers and some food and giving out free 58 grill replacements. So we're going to grill and chill. <laughs> We'll have a little bit of live music. Uh, we'll have some yard games. It's kind of a hybrid indoor outdoor thing. So there'll be plenty of space. Um, so come on down uh, on your Saturday if you want uh, some free food and to hang out with me and a bunch of other sure folks. Uh, that evening at the Tin Roof downtown on Broadway, we're teaming up with Bus Call uh, to do a 58 day special edition of Bus Call. This is also in Nashville. Uh, Jen, out by you, sort of, uh, in Tustin, California, which is near Los Angeles, Anaheim area. Uh, some of our partners out there are going to do a battle of the bands at Jim's Music. Um, this is an audio gear, one of our rep firms out there event. So that will be 1 to 3 p.m. out in Tustin. Uh, Floribama. I've never been to, but I've heard incredible things of the Floribama bar on the border of Florida and Alabama. Uh, uh, this is a evening event as well. I think I got to check, uh, check my text here. I've been informed, uh, 3 PM, 3 PM at Floribama. If you're near that bar down there on the borderline, come check out a little event. We'll have some live music, some giveaways, and then also in Dayton, Tennessee at main stage music at 3 PM as well. Uh, you can find some of that info on uh, our website, our 58 day landing page as well. So if you're near those places, please stop by. Uh, mine thinks had questions because that's how I usually end it, but I think we're done with questions. Uh, anything else to add, everybody? Sweet. Well, Ken, thank you so much for being here. Michael Pedersen being in the background, answering those questions. We really appreciate it. Everybody uh, celebrate your 58th day on Saturday. If you're nearby, come say hello, uh, and we'll talk soon. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye. See you. Bye.